Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the In the Eleven podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Griffiths, and this is the show where we bring on those from the world of football to show you what it takes to be in the Eleven at the highest possible level. This week's guest is Jared Odenbeck, a player who had a, a really promising collegiate career, was pl- playing at a really high level at Wake Forest, and thought that that was going to transfer into uh, you know a highly successful, immediate professional career in the United States and unfortunately hit some bumps in the road and it just didn't quite work out like that. Found his way to Sweden, New Zealand, you know, back in America with a NISA team, back to Sweden again. And and now kind of as you hear in our discussion, just sort of finding that groove and and finding that sweet spot where he feels like the football and and life is starting to mesh together and all that hard work and the, the suffering kind of paid off in what is the final product now. So it's a really interesting conversation. Really looking forward to sharing that with you guys. Um, We actually had to record this on two separate days. So there's some, just some, it shouldn't affect the quality of the interview, but there's just, um, if you're watching on the video, you might notice some differences um, from one to the next, and there might be some transitions in there. Um, but speaking of that though, if you are a listener of the podcast, if you could do me a huge favor and go ahead and follow the podcast on YouTube, subscribe to the show on YouTube, check out one or two of the video episodes as we will be continuing to upload both of those video and audio. Um, thank you so much for your continued support, for your continued listenership. I will not keep you any longer. Here is myself and Jared. Jared Odenbeck coming to us live from Sweden. Um, Jared, thanks so much for for taking the time out of your schedule to uh, chat with us and and talk a little bit of football and share your story. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, man. I'm really looking forward to it. Absolutely. Um, You know, being right now at the World Cup time and you being an American over in in Sweden, what's kind of the atmosphere like around around this time? I know obviously Sweden not being in the tournament, I'm sure has some some locals a little bit upset. But, you know, being an American kind of isolated away, what's just been the the atmosphere, I guess, around uh, the tournament or just football as a whole right now? Yeah, I mean, people are watching it. Um, It's on everywhere. I mean, everyone Mm. follows it. Um, to be honest, I haven't followed it all that much. I would say I've seen, I've probably seen about like three, four and a half games of football. Uh, unfortunately wow. two of those were games from the U S so, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, I, I like the direction that the U S is going and I think that if you had asked me, you know, four or five, six years ago. Uh, and told me that the U.S. is doing a lot of the things that they're doing and playing the way that they're playing and have players in all these top clubs that are young and exciting and promising, I would have been absolutely pumped. Mm. That said, I just, I've never, I've never been sold on Greg Berhalter. Mm. Um, he actually has a horrendous track record here in Sweden. Like, <laughs> uh, people, people rip on him all the time. If anyone's like, if anyone's like really deep in like the tactics and the coaching world, like, uh, and, and they speak to me, whether it's a coach or a player or anyone, they always rip on Greg Berhalter because he was at a club in, um, in Alsvenskan in the top league here called Hammarby mm. and mm. just had a horrendous time. So that's, that's like everyone's understanding of Greg and then that and like wearing Jordans on the touchline, like throwing behind the back <laughs> passes and all that. I'm just like, man, I'm. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so out on all that. Like, um, but yeah, I think, I think all in all, we probably got what we deserved from the tournament in the U S. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It is, it is funny. Like if if you question, if you like don't agree with some of the tactics, right. There's so many things that you can kind of start to like add on and say, why is he wearing a t-shirt? Why is he wearing Jordan? Like, why is he doing behind the back? It, It is, it is funny. Like definitely you can tell the fans that are already, come in with a level of frustration about like what they're seeing on the pitch. Then they're like, and what the hell is he doing on the touchline too? <laughs> yeah. 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 He's like trying to be a uh, hype beast tactics guy. And like, uh, yeah, I don't know. He's just, 
He's got too many balls in the air. He just needs to focus on football. Yeah. For uh, I'm always curious about this for for players that, that go overseas and play, right? Because I think there's oftentimes two sort of schools of thought, and one of which being like, for example, you when you move to Sweden, it's like kind of I'm building a new life here in Sweden, right? And I'm putting up roots, and this is kind of you know I'm, I'm living abroad. Um, whereas others often view it as kind of no, I'm an American. I live in America, but I'm, you know, I'm going overseas for my contract, right, to play, um, and it's for work. And then I and I leave and I go back home. Um, I mean, obviously, you mentioned to me before we jumped on that you're married now as well. So I have to imagine there's much more of a deeper connection to that country. But what's kind of that relationship like with you as an American, um, you know, moving to a country like Sweden? Like, how how do you balance those two those two parts of yourself? Yeah. So. I first moved here in 2017, which quite a long time ago, um, the summer of 17. And, uh, I really, I really took that opportunity because I had a whole lot of nothing. Um, I'd been with Charlotte independence, uh, signed through 2017 and had like a ton of groin problems in 2017 that I just couldn't get over. And I was never fit. And, um, yeah, so they were just, the time I was playing as a center back, they were signing center backs. Like I think they signed two in the, in the spring after I was signed just like for depth. Cause they knew that one, I wasn't uh fit. And then two, I, when I came back, I wasn't going to be at the level and I mm. wasn't going to give them like a viable, uh, I guess spot on the depth chart that they could count on. So the coach, Mike Jeffries, super nice guy was just really frank and honest with me. And he kind of like explained that to me and he's like, you know, the picture that we had at the start of the year was a lot different than what we have now. Now the picture kind of seems like this and, you know, you can have this contract, you can be here through the end of the year. You're a value member of the team, no matter what playing wise, it's not going to be good for you. Um, obviously we've signed players for depth. You're not really in the conversation to play. And so I really appreciated that. And I was like, uh, yeah, really thankful that he had said that. And, um, I had a random opportunity through a, a friend that I uh, knew from Wake Forest and um, she had like a, a cousin or like an uncle or something who was a Swede and like used to coach a team in the fourth tier here. And she kind of like mentioned to, to me like after we graduated in, uh, in December because she signed for a club here um, in the Damo Svenskan in like the women's highest league, which is like a proper women's level. She was like, yeah, you know, if you, if you want to go to Sweden and like play there, like, you know, I know a guy who like coaches in the fourth tier or something. And I was like, that sounds horrendous. Like, there's no way I want to do that. <laughs> but anyways, like things happen in life and like you end up, yeah, it ended up becoming like a thing. So I, I canceled my contract in the USL championship um, to go on trial in the fourth mm -hmm. tier of Sweden. And um I just wanted to play, man. I really just wanted to like get into a team and let it rip and just play games. Like that's what I wanted. And when I first came here, like I obviously I couldn't speak any Swedish at all. Like I didn't understand anything. Like there were no international guys in my team because it's a fourth tier. Like it's a small like farming community, like maybe 30 minutes south of Gothenburg, which is like a big city, second biggest here, which is where I live now. Um. And you're like, you're in training and coaches explain stuff and like, you have no clue what they're saying. Yeah. And so there would just be like a, a guy or two who would come and say like, oh, like the rules are this, like you need to make 10 passes. Like, and granted, like I never knew what the count was. Like yeah. the count could be on 10, it could be on 20. Like I had no freaking idea. And then when you go into the locker room after training, guys are talking and like, they can all speak English pretty well, but you know, you're just like, you're the one guy who can mm -hmm. do what they're doing. So I just found myself like paranoid all the time. Like I'd be in the shower, like between two guys and like, I mean, they could be saying that I suck. Like they could be saying I'm the worst player they've ever seen in their life. They could mm -hmm. be like making fun of me. Like they could be doing anything and I have no clue. So at the start it was, um, it was really disorienting. And when I look back, I realize like, man, I was so American in so many moments. Um, 
and I even I even went back to my to my original coach and just like apologized for like a lot of things that I did because my like American like normalized mentality was like quite offensive in a lot of ways to them which I didn't even realize at the time until like until later and I started to understand the culture more Mm -hmm. Hmm. Uh, and so I guess I have two kind of follow-ups to that like one do you think part of that initial hesitation towards even looking at Sweden as a viable option right like when your friend brings that opportunity to you and you're like no absolutely not I don't want to go anywhere near that like is (laughs) Is part of that because of like, because I mean, obviously, as we'll get to, you know, you played at a high level collegiately, like Wake Forest is, you know, cream of the crop, right when it comes to kind of the university level in the United States. And, and I think it's, it's really interesting to have, you know, players like yourself who play at that high level, which we view as sort of like the pinnacle in the United States. And then like, Sweden fourth tier, yeah, it's still professional. But like you said, you're going to like a little farm village where, you know, the locker room is like a shack that's behind the the pitch, right? Like those are kind of the opportunities that a lot of times players will get for their first chance. So like, was that a little bit of that kind of like you mentioned that Americanized maybe mindset or like, can you kind of elaborate that on that a little bit where maybe that caused like some friction that you look back on? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I would just say too, like fourth tier of Sweden is definitely not professional. <laughs> <laughs> like you might you might get some money on the side like in it and again like professional is a very fluid term exactly yeah. um people have different meanings with professional um but i think at the time i just had way too much pride like i just thought i was too good mm. and um yeah i thought i was i thought i was better than other people and i think that in America, you have a lot more people who have this kind of like superiority complex. Like, and by that, I mean, like Zlatan would be like on the extreme end of that. Right. Where it's just like, you have a lot of self-belief, like you're not afraid to like tell people about that. And sometimes like I'll have people reach out to me who, you know, they mean, well, they want to come here. They want to play for, for some reason they reach out to me and say, Hey, like, how did you do it? You know, how can I do this? And I hear them talk about themselves and I'm just like, and it's not necessarily like right or wrong, but I'm like, dude, if you say that in a locker room, like in Sweden, like people are going to hate you and they're going to think you're the most arrogant guy in the whole world. And in the U S like there's like 10 or 15 other guys that are saying that. So I think for me, it was, it was really just, um, it was needing to mature as a person, um, it was needing to learn that one, I wasn't as good as I thought. And that too, there was a lot of people out there in the world who maybe didn't have any kind of like, you know, glamorous CV or something like that, or like playing in a big club or whatever, but they were like just as good. And a lot of times like better than I was. And, um, I think that that started to really make me ask myself a lot of questions in that, in that phase of my career. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm really glad that it ended up happening the way that it did. Otherwise, like I wouldn't have had to like humble myself in that way or like be humbled without even wanting to be humbled, I guess, if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think it's it's really interesting sort of the you know, the timeline or the the journey that all footballers go on, right? It's kind of like these peaks and valleys of whether it be just your career as a whole, like having successes and then failures or just kind of like the ebbs and flows of your confidence right because like it really resonated with me when you were talking about being in Sweden and yes so many people speak English right but all the players are consistent like for me it was all the players are consistently speaking Danish so even though they they can translate for you all their conversations are always going to be in Danish so it's like you can never really just jump in on a conversation as you could you know like when you're in Charlotte right? Um, So you always feel that disconnect. And like you said, you have no idea you play a bad pass. And I don't know, they could all just be looking at each other like, yo, this guy's the worst player I've ever seen in my life. But I don't know. And so I think for me, it kind of, it made me shy away from the moment a little bit. It made me go into my shell more and more. And I, like you said, maybe I had some of that paranoia. Like I just kept thinking that like, oh, what if they are saying that about me? What if they are Mm. saying that about, and then you kind of have to 
maybe there is a not quite arrogance that you want to have, but there's a little element of you still have to be confident, right? And you can't always have that fear in your head of, well, everyone's disconnected from me and I'm othering myself. And um, it, it, it is fascinating, right? Because I think maybe in a way that was one thing that allowed you to grow so much more in your career, but also it, it maybe kept you afloat a little bit in the beginning, like that, that kind of pride that you had or that belief in yourself when you're in an environment where you feel like, I don't know what everyone's thinking about me or saying about me. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, but first of all, dude, Danish is uh Danish is a wild language. <laughs> yeah. Like people say all the time, you know, like, Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, like they go together a bit. Like, to be fair, like I can understand most Norwegians. Danes, dude, I have no clue what they're saying. Like none. Like yeah, and if, if it's written, like Danish, Danish written, like is actually for a Swede, like pretty easy to understand. Mm -hmm. But spoken, oh my days. And I can't even imagine like coming from the US in in your situation and like just having english like i don't know if you speak other languages but danish is wild it's truly a wild language yeah well that was the thing um, like i had some german background and i like felt like i was sort of starting to pick that up and i was like all right you know germanic languages germany denmark so close together then i'm in denmark i'm like what is happening <laughs> yeah so i'm yeah i mean i would just get i would just get really afraid um and i would i would just make decisions in, in a game that I knew were like going to be a hundred percent success rate instead of like taking on a risk because then I knew that they like, they wouldn't really have a go at me. And like, it wasn't like they were just super cruel or anything like that. Or like, yeah, even like unkind really, but it was just that I kind of got to the point where I just had so much fear and cared so much about what other people thought because I didn't, I didn't really have any, like, I didn't really have any like relationship or like anyone in my, anyone in my corner in that sense. Like I had a couple of guys that I was like decently close with on the team, but like I would only see them at training and like, then I would go home, you know, cause they're all working and like, I was just doing whatever I wanted. So, um, yeah, I think just like a lot of loneliness and then like that loneliness just meant that like I really needed people's approval in order to like feel good about myself. Yeah. Small world of small world of coaching um and some of those early emails that you were getting. Which I do it is a funny point that you make as well like how it, I remember I thinking the same thing kind of in the college recruiting process like you're such a young kid basically trying to make this decision you have all these like grown adult coaches kind of emailing you looking to get you to commit or, or get you to make this huge life decision. And then I'm sure I probably did the same thing with certain coaches, like just wouldn't communicate, didn't communicate in a way then that I would now. Right. So um, it's, it's funny. Yeah. And, and the funny thing, like with Wofford was like, it wasn't even like, I wasn't even like, I was like, Hey, screw you guys. Like, mm. you know, I'm, I'm too good or something. I was just like, Oh, I'm not really that interested. And like, I think they probably sent me an email and I just didn't respond, which like looking back, I should have responded. But in the moment, like I was just like, Oh, like there's tons of players out there that will want to go to Wofford, like, and good for yeah. them for like for that. But um, yeah. So it, like going into my junior year, it was really like Virginia, Wake Forest, Georgetown, Stanford. Like that was pretty much, what I wanted. Um, and it ended up getting cut down pretty quickly to really by like halfway, like the winter of my junior year, like it was pretty much like set between Stanford and Georgetown. And that was because Wake came and watched me play at the Academy Showcase, which was always in Florida back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I remember them seeing like pull up to the sidelines and I was like, oh, frick, like I, <laughs> I need to like, and start like bawling out or something right and all this stuff gets in your head but um they ended up reaching out to me um afterwards and they were kind of like oh like you can go into like a preferred walk-on spot and i was like dude screw that yeah. like yeah. <laughs> like again i i had a lot of pride and like i i thought i was too good for that and like one of my best friends at wake sam fink he ended up playing in the usl for like 
seven years. He has the most appearances ever for St. Louis FC. Um, he was the captain at St. Louis FC. Ended up being the captain at Wake. He was a straight up walk on at Wake, and they were like, "You're never gonna play." And he was just like, "Screw you guys! Like, of course I'm gonna play!" Like, yeah. So like, it just goes to show that like, it, and there's plenty of guys at Wake and plenty of guys at tons of other programs who have gone on to play for the freaking U.S. national team mm. that were walk ons in college. And so it just goes to show like, no matter what someone's perception of you, even if that person is going to be your coach in like six months, things can change so fast in football. Yeah. Um, and so I, I said no to that. Um, even though I, I really wanted to go to wake from the time I was a kid, like from when I was a little kid growing up in North Carolina, that's when they were like going to the final four. Like, I think it was like four or five years in a row or something. And I was like, and they were playing such good football. And I was just like, man, this place is amazing. Like I would love to go here, but that didn't work. I visited UVA, didn't like it at all. Just didn't like the feel, um, couldn't really see myself there. And I didn't feel like they really wanted me there that badly either. Um, great school though, beautiful place, amazing facilities, great coaching staff at the time. Um, I visited Georgetown a couple times, loved it. Um, they really wanted me there, which was huge. Um, mm. That year, they lost in the national championship against Indiana which was huge because they like finally broke through as a program, which like I had felt like they were going to do for a while. Cause they were like kind of on the rise and I like DC a lot. Cool place. Great staff as well. Amazing. Brian Weiss, he's still there. Um, the assistants were Zach Samuel, who's now the head coach of American also in DC and Brian Gill, who's the head at UPenn now. Yeah. So like, they're just all like amazing guys and like amazing football minds as well. And, uh, I remember going out to Stanford in December or maybe it was January of my junior year of high school visiting there, dude, everything there is so nice. It's insane. It's totally <laughs> sure, insane. Yeah. Like, it's like, I don't know. Like I was like, when am I going to see something that's not good? Like, when am I going to see something that's not perfect? Mm. That's not like, Oh, we're the best in the world at this. Oh, we're also best in the world at this. And like, I don't know. I, I was out there and, like great group of guys, obviously like Jeremy is a great coach. Like I played under him for a while and have, I have nothing but good things to say about him as a, as a guy and as a coach. Um, but I just remember like looking at my mom and going like, if I go here, I'm going to get so comfortable and I'm also going to become like the most elitist person in the whole world. And that's <laughs> not like, a, that's not a comment on people from that area of the world. It's not a comment on people who graduate from Stanford. I just like had this feeling like, dude, if I end up here, like my head is going to be in the clouds mm. and I'm going to think that I'm the best thing ever. And I think it's inevitable. Like when you leave a place like that, like in a lot of ways, things are only going to go downhill for you. Like you leave those facilities, mm. you leave that like bubble of the world. It's so beautiful in Palo Alto. You leave that bubble of the world. It's like, yeah, okay, you can go work at like some place in Silicon Valley or something if that's your thing. But like, yeah, I don't know. I was just like, it's only going to get worse from here if I go here. <laughs> so I committed to Georgetown and um, yeah, that was that. Yeah, so you kind of mentioned a lot of different factors along that journey that you were really looking at analyzing for like where would be the perfect home and, and fit for you. Um, looking back on it, like what, how would you kind of rank some of the things, um, in terms of making that decision? Or, you know, if you had to advise a younger player coming up and making a college decision, um, how would you kind of go about doing that? Because I know you mentioned like, okay, Wake Forest is my dream school, but they didn't quite give me the offer that I wanted, but you know, some players took that offer and ran with it to, to great heights. So like if uh, I'm sure, obviously you might not change anything going back, but like if you were going to advise a player, what would be the things that you would look for and say, Hey, make sure that you really like the coaching staff or make sure that, you know, this, that, and the other things that you got to have checked off. Yeah. I mean, well, the, the first thing I had to actually say is go work with my friend Zev. Um, he's the college soccer guy on Instagram. Seriously. Mm -hmm. Like he will help you out. And if you're a kid, like in high school, listening to this, or even if you're a college player and you want to transfer, like go connect with him because he's like 
super dialed in and helping tons of people in this area right now. Mm -hmm. Um, plus just a great guy, but from my own experience, I would say you really don't know that much when you're like 16, 17, 18, you know, way less than you think. Yeah. And you know, you don't know yourself that well either. And especially you don't know yourself in like three or four years, you're only reacting off of like that moment. And you're probably reacting a lot off of what you think other people will think of your choice. Mm -hmm. And I think that the most important thing is that you're going somewhere where even if football goes bad, you're still going to enjoy getting up every day and being with that group of guys and being in that environment and playing under that coaching staff. And so for me, I would say like, screw all the names, like screw all the flashy, like fancy stuff, go somewhere where you fit in really well with the group and where you have a lot of belief from the coaching staff, because ultimately like you don't want to go somewhere that's easy, but you also don't want to say like, Oh, I'm going to this place at all costs. And then you go there and after like, you know, a, a month or two months, you're miserable. And again, like it's impossible to project how things are going to go. Like for my buddy, Sam, like it went amazing for him. Like Ike Opara played for the national team and in the MLS for like 12 or four, like 13 years, he was a walk on at wake. Hmm. So you just, you just never, you never know how things are going to go, but because you don't know how things are going to go, you want to lock in a few things that you know are going to be there. And if the group yeah. of guys is there for you, you enjoy the environment, you like the school, you feel like it's a place where you can grow and develop as a person and you have some belief from the coaching staff. I think that's a, a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's really great advice. Cause uh, you know, I think a little bit of the cynic in me, right. Says that there's probably some coaches out there that when they tell a player, yeah, you're going to be a walk on, or I don't see you playing at this program. They probably either mean it, or if they get to a point where that, like they're so prideful that they don't want to be wrong necessarily and then give a player a chance. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I would hope that there's a lot of coaches out there that aren't like that, but sometimes it is a little bit of like, if a coach is telling you something, listen to them, you know what I mean? Like there are definitely coaches that out there that can change their minds and, and kind of redefine you as a player. But we both know there's coaches out there that are like, once they have your opinion of you, it's not, it's not going to change. That's, that is what it is. So, um, how did that kind of then transpire in your college journey? Like you chose Georgetown because of some of those things that you felt like fit with your, um, you know, your values, kind of what you wanted out of a program. And then how did that first season go? I mean, obviously I know it led to you transferring kind of back to uh, Wake Forest, but what was that first season like for you at Georgetown? Yeah, the first season was a bit of a whirlwind. So going in, um, all of the communication that I had had from the staff was kind of like, you're going to play like mm -hmm. there's a spot opening up, like along the back four as a center back, like right when you come in, we see you filling that spot. Um, so that was great. Uh, but I think it was like, I think it was on national signing day. Um, they signed this kid named Josh Yarrow, who is now, playing for the new St. Louis uh, MLS. He played for Philly Union yeah. for a bunch. Like, He's like the second overall pick well, or something. So he was, he, was my, he was my roommate. He was my roommate at Georgetown, Josh Yarrow. Unbelievable yeah. guy, man. What a human being he is. He's incredible and an incredible player as well. And uh, to be fair, he just had qualities that I didn't have. And his qualities fit into our back four much better than mine did. And he was just at a level of like physical competency um, and even his reading of the game that I just wasn't at. Like he was like, no joke. He was the fastest player in the big East. No question as a freshman, maybe in the whole country. And he was a center back. Wow. So it was just like, yeah, I mean, he was, he was getting generation Adidas offers like from his freshman year. So it's like, yeah, I'm not mm -hmm. at that level. And so uh, I remember like preseason first day, couple of guys from the staff come up to me and they're like, Hey, like, we're thinking about shifting you like into the six, like, how would you feel about that? And like, at that point, like the writing had already been on the wall. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, ah, man, like, 
seriously, like I, I had built up all these expectations and uh, I was kind of just trying to like block them out. I was like, oh, maybe I'll play, like maybe I'll be in with a starting group or whatever. And then they, and then they come to me the first day. And so I'm like, like, what are you going to say? Yeah, of course. Like I'll take that. Mm. Um, the guy who was, well, we really played with two sixes. The guys who were playing at the six, um, one of them, Joey Dillon, just solid as the day is long. He was an all American, uh, drafted by Salt Lake, ended up playing for what's now Phoenix rising for, I think like a couple of years, like lost the ball, maybe like five times the whole season. Right. Just like <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> like, yeah. And he was, a, he was a beast in the press. Like his, his reading of the game was insane. One of the best I've seen. Um, just so underrated and steady. And then the guy who played next to him, Tyler Rudy, also ended up being an All-American, played in the MLS for the Revs for like three years, um, and then finished his career in the NASL, the old NASL with Puerto Rico. Unbelievable player. Could hit like a 60, 70 yard ball, like on demand. <laughs> Just like <laughs> no questions asked. Yeah. Um, and so I, I was like, all right, I'm not going to be playing at all. Like, so, I mean, I, I was getting, I was getting minutes off those guys, like whenever they needed a breather, mainly off of Rudy. Um, just cause Joey was just never going to come out of the game. He was just too steady. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So I just, I remember that year was really, really hard for me from a football standpoint. Um, cause it was, it was the first time where like I hadn't played in my life. And I think that mm -hmm. happens to a lot of people when they get to college. And so I started kind of looking around and saying like, what's wrong with me? And of course, like those guys were better than I was. Like, it wasn't a question, but I felt like I needed to not just be better, but almost like become something that I wasn't. So I was training like heaps, like I would train like two or three times a day. Like it was super unhealthy, physically, mentally across the board. Um, and I, I mean, the coaches were really encouraging to me. Like they told me, Hey, you're doing well. Like we like your progression. Like, and I felt like I was improving throughout the course of the year, like understanding the position more and stuff like that. Um, but I just, I was really lonely, to be honest. I, mm -hmm. I grew up in like a pretty, pretty conservative, like Christian school kind of culture in, in Charlotte where that's just like, it's not even so much like people's belief. It's just like how the culture is, to be yeah. honest. And like DC is way more in your face, you know? Like, <laughs> and uh, yeah, a lot more secular than I was used to at, at that moment. And um, that made it hard for me to interact with a lot of people who are just way different. Like the Northeast and the South are just like polar opposite ends of the spectrum in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean that the Northeast is wrong. Like, it's funny because like where I live right now is like further along the spectrum than the Northeast is. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, I just didn't really have that many friends. Like um, two of still like my really good friends were like my only real, like close friends there. Um, one guy that was on our team that was a junior and um, another guy who was the football quarterback who was um, good mates with that guy that was on my team. So besides those two guys, like I was just like, and Josh, I was just like, yeah, pretty miserable, pretty depressed. And then like football wise, like that was really impacting my life. Not to mention, I would never advise going to Georgetown if you're not that good at school. Because <laughs> it is. It is super hard, dude. Holy moly. I grinded so hard for a 3.0 and I, yeah, I was just miserable. I was, I was pretty miserable. It wasn't really anyone's fault. It was just like, yeah, square peg, round hole. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, uh, I think you hit on like really a, a complete and full reason of why maybe it is right for a player to transfer because I think like, and I've talked about this on a few other episodes, but there is uh, and, and I speak to college coaches now and they're like, the transfer portal is absolutely insane. You know, oh, dude, it's semester, nuts. Everyone wants to yeah. transfer now. Every semester it, uh, it, it feels like it exponentially grows. And, you know, you, you look at those situations and you're like, how many of those kids really are transferring like for the right reasons? Or are they transferring because, you know, just they had a little falling out with the coach or they're not playing the number of minutes that they want to be playing or they think they should be. At a, at a higher level than they really are. But I think that kind of picture that you just laid out for us represents a pretty good reason to transfer, right? Like, because 
even things off of the pitch aren't really fitting the way that they're supposed to be for my college experience. And I'm not really happy socially and, and maybe I need a, a different fit for myself um, in that regard. And because like, as I'm sure, you know, all those things, they start to kind of bleed into your football. Like if you're not quite okay off the field and, and things aren't really going well, like it's impossible to just check that at the door and then come out and perform every single day in training. Um, as I'm sure, as I'm sure you experienced in that, in that first year there at Georgetown. Yeah, totally. And like, again, just going back to like a lot of the habits that I had off of the pitch in terms of how much training I was doing, like, I didn't even like really have a whole lot to offer. Like when I turned up to training, cause I was yeah, training too much probably. outside. Yeah, totally. Totally. Like, um, and I think just, yeah, emotionally I was just fried as well. And yeah, I just, I just remember the difference of how it felt like a year later, basically to train with like a full focus to be actually like present, able to give a hundred percent within a session versus like, yeah, feeling like a shell of myself to be honest mm. in a lot of different departments. So yeah, I think that, I think that environment is probably one of the most underrated things for any player. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would completely agree with that. So when coming back to wake forest, was that almost like a, a, a breath of fresh air for you to kind of come back home, so to speak, and be in that environment that you felt more comfortable in? in playing or, or what was that experience like of the transition? Yeah. I mean, the, to be honest, it was a bit of a cold shower, the transition, like, uh, wake was, wake was way more intense of a like football environment than Georgetown was. And Georgetown was like a really good environment, mm. but, um, Jay Vitovich, who's the coach at Pitt now, he was the coach when I got there and the way that it all worked out was hilarious as well. Like, uh, I remember I was looking to transfer and like looking at a few different schools and my dad was like, Hey, like, why don't you call up wake? Like you really wanted to go there. And I literally like laughed at him on the phone. I'm like, dude, that's ridiculous. Like they didn't, they offered me like a preferred walk on spot and I played <laughs> like 12 games and like, I don't know, not that many minutes, right? Like probably 500 minutes or something. And you want me to like, call up those guys and say, Hey, uh, look at my highlight video of me connecting like simple 10 yard passes, like yeah. <laughs> coming off the bench with the sticks. Like that's absurd. But it was like, one thing that my dad always taught me is like the worst that someone can tell you is just to say no. And then you're in the same situation that you would be in otherwise. Yeah. And, um, that's like good wisdom I've used throughout, throughout my life. But I remember I, I got in touch with them. And, uh, we set up a phone call and they were kind of like, yeah, like send us, send us your video. Um, we'll see like how you look. We haven't watched you obviously for like a year and a half. So I sent them the video. They'd only see me play as a center back. They saw me play as a six and they were like, Hey, uh, like how does a full ride sound? And I was like, what? Like I, I, I like, honestly, I didn't even answer on the phone. Cause I thought it was like a joke or like a gag or something. And, uh, they were like, yeah, like, how does that sound? And I was like, yeah, like that sounds amazing. I'm in like, just tell me what I need to do. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it worked out pretty well. Cause the, um, there was a six named Jared Watts. He played for the Rapids and MLS for like five or six years. Unbelievable player as well. He had just graduated. So they needed, they needed a guy in that spot. And we had kind of like similar profiles. Like I was no, no nowhere near his level at the time, but similar profiles in terms of our body and how we wanted to play and stuff. So, but, uh, yeah, I got there right away, man. And it was like baptism by fire. It was just so intense. And like wake is, um, playing, playing under Jay at wake was a really special experience. He was one of the most demanding, but I would say easily the coach that I've had the most respect for in my whole career, just because of how much he held himself to a high standard and how much he was always educating himself. Like you would pop into his office during the week for your meeting. And like, he'd be in there watching clips of like Bayern Munich training. And that was when Pep was there or he'd be watching like Bielsa run sessions and stuff like that. And he was always like trying to advance his own game. And 
he would never demand anything. I think of the players that he wouldn't demand anything of himself. But I mean, mm. if I if I spoke to you in private, I could go on and on about stories <laughs> <laughs> about training sessions and stuff that he said and and stuff like that. But yeah, um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't easy because the standards were out were really really high, and um, the environment was pretty cutthroat and really competitive. But I would say that's where I really like that's where I really really learned how to compete. And like mm. what it meant to hold yourself to like a really high standard every single day. Yeah. Can you, can you help to kind of paint the picture for a player who may be looking at that level and, you know, help them understand what that really means to have a, a cutthroat environment and to have a culture where like everything is, is earned, you know, nothing is given it. and maybe you know, not to say that it's necessarily toxic, but it kind of, it toes that line sometimes, right? Where things can get heated and it's a, it's a training environment where you kind of like, like you said, walking into, to a cauldron, um, almost every single day. Like, I think those environments can be some of the most shaping for a footballer, um, because they really test you and they can also be super demanding. And, and I think a lot of players think they kind of know what that is, until they actually experience one where they're like, oh, this is like nothing I've ever been a part of before. Like, can you kind of help to paint the picture, maybe even what you were sort of feeling on a day to day basis, kind of being around that team? Yeah, totally. I mean, I would say first, like, it's just the ultimate accountability. Like, it's not just the coach that's holding you to a standard, but all the all the senior players are holding you to that as well. And um, like my buddy, Sam, when I was a sophomore, he was a senior, he was the captain. He was the most intense guy I've ever seen. Uh, like, no, I've never met anyone as intense as this guy. Like mm. he wanted to win everything. And like, he wasn't the kind of guy who would like cheat to win. Like he was going to win. And then he was going to like yell in your face when he won and just basically like tell you that you need to like lift your standard. Cause it's not good enough. Yeah. And um, like in the off season, every single run that we did, he was just like emptying the tank and just like refusing to lose. And I think it was just like taking pride and giving your absolute best and then holding other people accountable. Like once you do that, that was kind of like a lot of the culture. And then of course, like Jay had outrageously high demands as well that were like, and, but that's what made, that's what made the difference for us. So, but like Sam, I mean, Sam would like throw himself into, into shots. He was a center back. He would like block a shot with his balls. <laughs> and then just get up and just scream in your just you would just get up and scream in your face you'd just be like yeah <laughs> and you'd be like oh my gosh like what's wrong with this guy dude? he's like <laughs> he's like a psycho yeah but like that's like that's what it took and like if the passing pattern wasn't right like jay, jay would let you know like yeah and it had to be at the standard and if it wasn't at the standard then training was going another 30 minutes until the standard was there and um, it's truly the definition of like a sink or swim environment, because if you can't hold the standard and on top of that, if you can't tolerate people holding you to it, you can't survive. Yeah. Like you're just, you're just going to be miserable. And that happened to a lot of people, man. Like, and it, it wasn't necessarily that they got like found out or anything, but it was just like, this isn't for me. Like, mm. This is too intense. The demands are too high. Like the margins are too small. If I make too many mistakes, guys are going to lose their mind on me. And on top of that, like I'm going to get rattled. <laughs> so like, yeah. I mean, I, I remember when I was first there, we used to play this game called 21. And um, simple game, 11 v 11. Um, but the goalkeepers, so it's between the boxes, like between the 18 and the 18. And it's just like, in your positions in an 11 v 11, uh, just keeping the ball. And you get a point for every one touch pass you can make first team to 21, one touch passes wins. Mm -hmm. But the catch is that if you turn the ball over on a one touch pass on the side of the pitch, depending on if it's in the spring or the fall, if it's in the fall, there's like a 50 pound sand filled medicine ball at the halfway line. If it's in the spring, there's a sled with two 45 pound plates on it mm -hmm. on the football turf. And if you do a one touch turnover, or if you play a square ball, like even if you connect a square pass on the pitch, the coaches will blow the whistle while the game is going, call your name out and you have to go to the side 
pick up the sand ball or push the sled down to the corner flag from the halfway line and back and your team has to play down a man and then yeah. you can come back into the game so one of my one of my first training sessions spring so the sleds are out i turn it over on a one touch i'm like all right whatever I'll, I'll go take the sled take the sled come back legs are heavy next one square ball i connect the pass but it's a square ball and they would always yell square ball get that out of your game <laughs> so then <laughs> you run to the side your team's down like there's probably maybe like another guy out as well who attempted a one touch and turned it over so maybe your team's down like two men who knows and if that's the case the other team's just taking the piss out of your team right they're just yeah. they're probably racking up the passes like the game might even be over by the time that you get back yeah so you got it you sprint for the sake of your team with the slide come back i come back in next pass Ball comes to me straight away, one touch turnover. And I remember it was freezing cold. I mean, it's probably like, I don't know, 15 degrees Fahrenheit outside, 7 a.m. January. <laughs> and I just like, I just remember like looking at the sky and just being like, F me, man. Yeah. And, uh, and the coach just like starts laughing, blows his whistle. He's like, yeah, Jared, F you, grab a sled. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, I was just like, man, what am I doing? Like, yeah, was this the right decision? Like, this is no, this is no better, no worse than, you know, what I was experiencing before. But um, over the course of three years, it ended up being, I think, the best thing possible for me at that time. So, yeah, really thankful. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things that kind of, like you said, it, it tests you, but then if you can hold your own it it can really shape you into kind of a, a new person almost but did you feel like that those three years that you then had at wake like maybe did that environment was that sort of the catalyst that drove you into wanting to keep pushing in the same way in the pro game or was it more like your just pure love of the game of football that that motivated you to still want to play at that professional level like what was the the motivation for you into graduating from wake and then saying all right i need to find a way to continue my football career here i just didn't see myself doing anything else mm. like i i truly had zero plan b and um that's not that's not life advice for anyone <laughs> <laughs> plan b's are always good to have um but yeah for me in my mind i think from when i was like 15 or so i was just like yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go as far as i can go on this road and like once the road stops then like yeah, I'll figure something else out. Um, like I, I studied English in college, total waste of your time. I wouldn't ever recommend doing that. <laughs> um, I actually, I actually do use it a little bit now, but, um, yeah, in terms of getting like a, a teaching job or whatever, that's what everyone always asks. Oh, what are you going to do with that? You're going to go teach? Heck no, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> so I just, yeah, I mean, I would say that the environment, the environment, taught me a lot of habits and taught me how to be a professional in a, in a lot of ways. Um, and how to just, yeah, how to just do my very best, like at everything that I'm doing throughout the day. And, um, it's really contagious because yeah, of course, like, don't get me wrong. We had guys on our team who just like totally take the piss, even guys who were like super good, you know, like they would play a lot, they would take the piss. Um, and there's no real, like right way to be a pro or to be a football player. Like, yeah. you know, um, there's definitely things that you shouldn't do like from a moral sense, but like, otherwise, like you just kind of have to find what works for you. But for me, I was never the guy with like bucket loads of talent. So I kind of had to try and find ways to get the most out of myself. But, um, I guess it was helpful from teaching me a lot of habits. But it was really, I guess the drive was really just like loving to play and just like, man, what, what else am I going to do? Like, I can always work a job when I'm like 30 or whatever. Like right yeah. now is like just kind of the time to like go and make it happen and like see how far I can take it. And I, I remember like graduating and the last two years I, I really didn't play like hardly at all. My sophomore year is a really good year for me. Jay then left and took the job at, at Portland Timbers. And um, Bobby Muse, who's the coach there now, great guy, great friend of mine. Um, he was very helpful for me in a lot of ways, too, in terms of challenging me on like an individual character level. Um, 
but I sat on the bench for, for my last two years at, mm. uh, at wake. And, um, that was a time of like a lot of personal refining for me. Um, and really like taking a look at my life and like figuring out like, like what, like, what did I have like besides football in my life? And like, just, uh, yeah. Examining like a lot of like bigger questions in life, I guess. And, um, learning what it meant to, to be a good leader. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is that? Like, what do you kind of discover about yourself in that process? Because I have to imagine that's, uh, um, a really unique position to be put in where you have this immediate success kind of sort of as a sophomore and then maybe get humbled a little bit and, and have to watch from the sidelines oftentimes when you're a junior and a senior, like it sounds like you spoke to it a little bit, but I know it's something that I have kind of, I mean, still battle with this to this day. It's like when you don't have that success on the pitch or when you're not playing football, like, who am I? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of this idea of what else am I besides a footballer? Because I think a lot of us in the in the beginning stages, we identify ourselves as this, you know, this athlete that plays this sport. Um, and when it's going great, and we're having success, and we're achieving things, then whew, life is dandy. But you know, sometimes when things aren't quite clicking the way that's supposed to be, it can it can get a little bit more challenging. So it sounds like that that junior and senior year experience was maybe an ex, a time like that for you where it really kind of tested you in a in a real way. Yeah, totally and I I think that I think that what you're hitting on right now is just like the question of identity in life. And yeah. it's it's totally fundamental for every human being no matter what you do is like who am I? Where do I get my significance from? Like why is life worth living? And I think that the the identity you were talking about is like a football player. And when you talk about it in this way, it sounds extreme, but really the, the place that people get to is if it's like, if I'm not successful at football, then my life like doesn't matter. Mm. And like, that sounds super intense and like, like mental, like mental health kind of stuff. Yeah. But that's really what people are saying. And like, that's what I was saying at that moment is I was like, man, if I can't play at Wake, then, well, I'm not going to go to the MLS and then I'm not going to be a pro. And then, well, everything mm -hmm. that I've worked for is just a total waste. And like, my life doesn't matter. And like, I'm a failure, basically. And like, I really got to the place where I was so miserable that I was like, like, I, I was miserable when football was going wrong. And um, I was really fortunate at that time to have a really good friend um, who was the captain at UCLA. His name's Grady Howe. And um, we got introduced through a mutual friend of ours and uh, he was just super instrumental in, in teaching me like just one-on-one, -on -one, just talking on the phone, like after games and just catching up over the weekend, like on off days and stuff, like about really helping me to shift my focus off of myself and to put it onto my teammates a lot more. Um, Matt Turner actually just did a really cool interview, like, I guess it was between one of the games the other day on Fox. Yeah. And uh, he was talking about how like the second he took his eyes off of himself, that he started to perform a whole lot better when he was just caring about the team. And um, for me, like once I started to shift my focus from just living in my own world and like identifying everything that I did as the most significant and only having thoughts for myself, only having thoughts for my own success. Once I shifted that to like, how can I help my teammates get better today? How can I help my teammates like reach their goals? Like, how can I build up and encourage like every single person on the team? And I would just like, I would go into training a lot of the time, just saying like, I'm gonna encourage every single person who makes a mistake that's like within like my voice of reach. And like, that's gonna be my, like, that's my goal for today. Like if football goes well, if it goes poor, like who cares? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that happened because like my coach, like, so going, going into my junior year, we had a vote for the captains and we would, 
always like have the players voting. They vote for three guys. I got voted as one of the captains. And my coach called me into his office and he said, hey, I wanted to let you know that you got voted for as one of the captains. And I'm like, wow, that's great. Like, but he was like, but I'm going to make the call to take that from you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> um, and I will, I will never forget what he said. And I, I still like text him all the time now and I, I bring it up to him. He said, you can't lead other people until you know how to lead yourself. And you don't know how to lead yourself yet. And so I can't have you leading the team yet. And I was like, okay. Like I was just shocked, obviously. And I was like, what do you mean by all that? And he was like, well, if I'm watching you train, number one, I can't bring my kids here to training because of the things that you're going to say when you make a mistake or if someone else makes a mistake. And so I was like, yeah, that's fair. Like I used to have a lot of problems with like anger and just like getting frustrated and like bad language and all that. And he was like, in second, like you just, you don't have any like self-control in terms of how you can deal with mistakes and how you can handle adversity. And like, you need to, you need to build that. Um, and so my last two years were really like a process of learning that. Mm. And um, if he hadn't told me that in that moment, like I probably wouldn't have ever had the self-awareness to like see that myself. Um, so yeah, just, just shifting that focus from myself, my own performance, having that be my whole world to having way more of like a stable foundation for my life um, of something that I could stand on, like no matter what happened in terms of football. And then, um, yeah. And then just, just looking at my teammates as well. And like thinking like, how can I make all these guys better? Like, how can we improve as a group? Like who cares what happens to me? Um, and that's hard to do. Like, yeah, that's not like an easy thing to do in the football world. And like, I, like if someone was like, Hey man, screw that. Like I'm out for myself. Like, look, I, I'll put my hand up and be like, dude, I totally understand. Like I totally yeah. understand. It's, it's, it's not beneficial to you necessarily in any way to do that. So I don't, I don't blame people, you know, cause everyone's like, Oh, you got to go out and get it for yourself or whatever. And like, yeah, to a certain point, that's true. But I think that another one of my friends, um, when I was first a pro and struggling a lot, he told me, dude, I was drafted in the MLS and people ask me, Oh, like you're a pro, like, you know, what was your career? Like, Oh, I was D three national player of the year. I was drafted in the MLS, like played in the USL and they're like, Oh, nice. Like they don't care at all. And he's like, dude, in, in five or 10 years, like no one is going to care how many minutes you played in the MLS. They're not going to care if you're in the USL. They're not going to care if you didn't like, yeah, if you win the champions league, or you play for Manchester United, like, yeah, we'll care. But I mean, if you look at like the Manchester United team in 2005 and you ask someone who loves football, they probably couldn't name a lot of the players just to be honest. Yeah. And so all that stuff fades away pretty quickly, but what lasts is like your character and who you are and like what you've built your life on. So yeah, I found, I found that out in those two years. Yeah. I, I think it's a really sound piece of advice because it, it's oftentimes what you'll hear people who, you know, struggle with anxiety or depression or things like that. Kind of a, an elixir to that can be, you know, if you give yourself more in service to others and you, whether it's volunteering or just like taking the shift away from, okay, what's going on with me? What am I worried about? What am I upset about to how can I help somebody else? Or how can I kind of shift my energy to how can I make somebody else feel a little bit better in this moment? It sounds like that was sort of something that really helped you progress your own self-development when you were a footballer as well. And, and it was something I was kind of curious of. I feel like maybe this was that moment where you kind of realized that, but I always do, you know, research for these and kind of like I, I look at some of the players like social media and also just like, you know, what they've done in their career. And I kind of noticed like in your social media, like there was this real connection to the people along your journey more so than like what you had done as yeah. a player. And like, yeah, and yeah, I was, um, I forget when that was, that might've been during COVID or something like the start mm -hmm. of COVID. I just wanted to like spotlight a lot of my teammates that I'd had. 
Um, cause like no one was playing at that point really. Yeah. And, um, 2020 was, <laughs> was a wild <laughs> season for me as, as a pro, um, as were a lot of years, but, um, yeah, I just, I wanted to just like spotlight a lot of my friends that had meant a lot to me and just like very much in the same way that you're doing, like, of just like sharing stories of people and hopefully encouraging those people in terms of like, Hey, like you meant, you meant this much to me. And then like, I want the world to know about that too. Yeah. And and I think it like, I think it might be something that we kind of have in common. And, and I hope it's something that I've started to learn now, especially playing the game for as long as I have. But like, there was kind of a point where I realized like, Oh, it's not necessarily about where I've played, what I've done, what accomplishments I've had, but it's like, this is this opportunity for me to have these relationships with people, these connections to teammates that it's, it's so deep and it's so bonded. And, and you know, as well as anybody, like it, it's just a different relationship with, that you've had. If you've like really gone in and played intense games with somebody and trained with somebody on a day in and day out basis. Um, and so it seems like the, the game sort of just became the vehicle for, forming these connections with people and like kind of building your network isn't the right word. Right. But that, that kind of footballing community um, is something that's really special. And it seems like that's kind of maybe what you started to realize in Wake Forest and then maybe progressing into your pro career as well and meeting all those people um, that you do from around the world. Totally. And I think what you're hitting on is um, it's funny. I've, I've actually been writing about this for work this week. Um, you're hitting on like the power of shared experiences mm. and shared experiences are really special. Like, you know, people talk about the military, right. And they go through all this training. They even go through these missions together, right. That are super intense, like top secret, undercover, whatever. Yeah. And that has a very like special effect that forms a lot of trust. And when you're in the cauldron of like training, intense environment, you're, you know, like you're in school and you're taking classes and you're going on the road and you're training like games and you have no time, but you're just in it like to the max with a bunch of guys who are all doing the same thing. It builds that trust and that trust creates a lot of unity. And that unity is something that will last like it's relationship at the end of the day. And, um, that's something that's really special about football. And unfortunately, like college is college is a unique environment because you Mm -hmm. have everyone doing the same thing and everyone's going in the same direction. Even if you have guys in your team who have an individual focus, yeah, everyone wants to win, you know, at wake the ACC, the ACC tournament, the national championship, that's everyone's aim. Even if you want to be an all American, like who cares? Like everyone has that aim. And then it's, it's a lot more difficult to create that once you get into the pro environment, but like, in the USL, I look at a team right now like Louisville City. They return like 16 to 18 guys every single year. Mm. And that tells me that like, okay, yeah, obviously the guys are good players, but not all of those guys are starters. Like only 11 guys can start. So that means that they have like, you know, six to eight guys of those returners every single year who aren't going to start for them, but mm. are so critical that they need them to stay. And it's because of this whole like shared experience, trust, unity, all of that, like that's absolutely critical. And I think if you can create that at a pro level as a coach, you're an absolute genius and it's only going to help your team. But again, it's, it's a real anomaly to have that at the pro level. It's really hard to find. Yeah. Yeah. I was just about to ask you that question. Cause I, I do, I do notice that, that it's, it's so different in college because you have not only that football shared experience, but these, all these life shared experiences that are happening at the same time. What, uh, yeah. what was that like when you immediately went into, or when, not immediate, or when you found your way into the, into Charlotte in the USL, like, did you kind of, was that a bit of a culture shock with that or, or kind of, was it able to be a seamless adjustment for you? I would say that it wasn't too much of a culture shock only because I, I was training with a lot of those guys in the off seasons mm. and I knew quite a bit of them. Um, so I had like a lot of existing relationships in the team. And then um, two of the other rookies that were in my team, I was super close with them. And then um, my friend Zev, who I mentioned earlier, the college soccer guy, he was also my teammate there. And um, so I, I had a lot of really great relationships in that team, to be honest. And 
there was a really, really good mix in that group of like younger guys who were just kind of getting into the start of their careers. A lot of guys who were like really, really good and really, really talented, kind of like mid age kind of deal. And then a group of like veteran guys who just like been there, done that, like every level, you name it. So mm-hmm. it was like, honestly, in terms of like planning a roster, it was one of the better planned rosters that I've, that I've been a part of. Um, and the culture was quite good, but you know, I didn't, I didn't hang out with that many guys from the team outside of like a select few, but that's kind of like how it is when you're a pro, you know, you find like three or four guys that you really like hit it off with. And like the rest of the guys you say, what's up to, you know, every morning and then see you later at, at the end of training or whatever. Um, but there's, there's always like a couple guys that you really will connect with in every locker room. So that's, that's kind of how it was in Charlotte, but I still got on great with a lot of the other guys. Yeah. But I know you said that um, that experience in Charlotte was kind of riddled like with some injuries and, and also some difficult experiences for you as a player. Um, and we spoke about it a little bit before with going to Sweden, like that transition, was it, was it difficult? Was it, frustrating kind of like leaving Charlotte like having the opportunity in the states and and feeling like okay I kind of made it and then being like all right I gotta I gotta pivot or again as I'm sure you've now looking back on your career understand that that's sometimes the way that the game just works you got to kind of pivot and okay make a make a snap decision to to further your career a little bit yeah I mean the the thing that was most difficult for me in 2017 was just my body like my body just sucked. Like I, it was like two weeks before the first game of the season, we we're doing some finishing and I took a left footed shot and I just felt like a big pop in my groin and I had never had any like real injury or like muscle injury or anything before. Like, um, so yeah, I, I started doing like PT and rehab for it. And I was just, I would like get better. I'd get better. I'd get better. I'd be like, you know, two weeks away from being like in a full training or something. And then I'd have a setback and I'd be like another month of rehab. And then I'd get better, get better. And then I was like six more weeks of rehab. And eventually like, um, by the time I went to Sweden, like I was, I was in training with independence full time. Like I was feeling fit. I had about like a month of training under me. So I had like some confidence in my body played here in Sweden, um, the full season, the last two weeks, like I started to feel a bit of pain again. And I was like, all right, it's whatever. I just finished these two games. I'll have six weeks to rehab, to do whatever, to get myself ready for going on trial places to try and see if I can get a work permit to stay here. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I just, I never got any better in that rehab. And then, um, funny enough, I went on trial with, uh, with a club called Jung Chile, which is where I play right now. And, um, I remember <laughs> the first day I was like, all right, like I hadn't kicked the ball in six weeks. Like I hadn't, like I had run a little bit and like felt decent, but I remember just feeling like uh like an 18 wheeler like trying to cut right just like like, and i'm not quick to begin with so i was just like man and it was so cold i mean it's probably like minus five celsius november pitch black by like 3 45 4 o'clock yeah just training in the cold dark and i just yeah i i got off the uh i got off the tram to walk back to my apartment and dude, I could like barely even walk. And I was like, dude, this is not good. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm supposed to be here for two weeks. Like, what the heck am I going to do tomorrow? Like, <laughs> so the next day, like I, I showed up and, and I tried and I mean, I couldn't even, I couldn't even run at like 60% really like yeah. couldn't pass it all with my left foot. My right was starting, my right groin was starting to hurt. And I was like, dude, this is like something seriously wrong. So. I just told the uh, the sporting director there, I was like, dude, I'm sorry, but this is like no dice. Like my groin is a shambles. Like I can't yeah. move. And he was like, totally understand. Like go home to the US, like figure it out. Like we'll keep in touch. Like maybe something will work out. You never know. Um, so yeah, I ended up going home and I ended up having to uh, have a pretty major operation on my groin actually. And, um, yeah, that started probably one of the worst years of my life. 
So this is at this point, 2018. Yeah, yeah, January of 2018, I, I had this operation. Um, I went to uh, the specialist in Philadelphia. And like, it's funny, a lot of my teammates that I ended up having in the future have, have gotten surgery off this guy as well. And like, he's just like the groin and hip guy. Like mm-hmm. uh, Ashley Young was in there when I was in there. And like a bunch of like NBA, NHL guys were in there, like all getting their groin just stitched up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the initial prognosis was like three months and you can play. So in my mind, I was like, all right, I'm mid January, I'm getting surgery. That means like mid April, I can play. That's Mm -hmm. not a good timeline for the USL. Yeah. So I pretty much had accepted at that point, like USL, like I'm toast. I'm not going anywhere in the USL. And, um, I ended up getting in touch with the, uh, the head coach of Tormenta, which is now in League One. But at that point, they were it was their last season in League Two, and they had announced that they were getting a League One. So they were kind of treating that season like, hey, come in, like be a part of a squad of like 23, 25 guys. And it's basically like a, a summer-long trial like to get a contract for League One. Mm-hmm. Um, so that sounded pretty good to me. And um, yeah, I went down there in 18 – great organization, like great group of guys, like still keep in touch with like a few of the guys from there. Um, but man, I was not fit like physically, <laughs> like fitness wise. I was fit body wise. I did not pass the ball with my left foot the whole summer. Oof. Um, I was scared to death and I didn't play at all. Actually. <laughs> I, uh, I did more, uh, I did more color commentating for uh, for ESPN Plus than I did for uh, <laughs> like playing minutes on the field, <laughs> which was which was kind of kind of cool. Like when I look back on it, like you're in the booth with like the ESPN guy, like with the headset and everything, and it gives you a it gives you a cool perspective on like how talented those commentators are because you're really like thinking on the fly with a lot of stuff, and there's just yeah, yeah. a lot of moving parts. So. Um, yeah, I got to, I got to work on my, uh, commentator CV that summer and, uh, take another like good dose of humility. Yeah. There you go for the, for the post playing career. You can seamlessly jump right into, to the booth. (laughs) Yeah. It takes Stu Holden's job. Exactly. Uh, it's really, it's something that, uh, it's so interesting, right? You mentioned how there's so many different elements to an injury, right? Where there's like kind of the the initial pain and then there's the, whatever the prognosis, whether you need just rehab or whether you need time away or whether you need an operation. Um, But I think a lot of people, they factor out of the equation that just because now like you're cleared, there's still a couple of hurdles that you need to overcome in order to really get back to playing but also playing the way that you know you can play right because you're gonna know yourself and what you can do on the pitch better than anyone and it's it's one of the most frustrating thing I think as a player and I recently came back from an injury where I pretty badly broke my wrist and it was like okay I'm fit and I'm playing but I'm not sharp I'm not like I can't feel it yet I can't like taste it what it's like to be on that same level that I was before um, and you always, you, you feel like, you know, right before that injury, you're like, oh, I was playing so well then. And of course it had to happen right now. You know, every injury, of course, it's the worst time to possibly get an injury. That's what we do to ourselves. But how did you kind of continue to push through and get over that mental block of like, all right, I'm healthy. The doctor says my body's healthy, but I need to get back to like the footballer that I know that I am. Yeah, to be honest, that didn't even happen until like 2019. I mean, 2018, like I wasn't healthy. Like I was, Mm. I was playing, but like for all intents and purposes, like I shouldn't have been playing. I mean, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have really been playing for all of 2018 and part of 2019 because like, I, yeah, I mean, even so 2018, so Tormenta, I leave Tormenta. They're like, Hey, we're not signing you. Like you can't even you can't even train or play. So <laughs> it doesn't, fair, doesn't fair. make sense. And I was like, yeah, no, no arguments there. Um, uh, but um, 
I did get in some pretty good mini golf there because they used to, I think they like, t- uh, they took it all out now, but their like HQ for the club was at this like uh, family fun center kind of thing. So they had like <laughs> go-karts, mini golf, arcade, bowling, like we would get food after training every day. So like me and, uh, me and one of my teammates, Michael Meekum, we just, we ripped it up on the mini golf, man. Get out there, get the shirt off, get the tan going and just play like 36 holes of mini golf after training. It was too good. You picked up so many like little skills just unrelated to football in your time in uh, Georgia. <laughs> yeah. Tormenta was just a holistic experience, man. Just totally yeah. holistic. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I wasn't fit. So I, I leave there and um, the guy who helped me come to Lindome in Sweden in 2017, he was kind of like, Hey, I know you're not fit. Like, I know you're not feeling great, but like come to Sweden and play division three, which is the fifth tier, which is like not good. Right. It's not good at all. Um, and, uh, my friend is like on the board there and they're in last place in division three and they have zero points through like the first half of the season. Like, do you think you could go play there and just like try and help them out? And like for you, like you need to play on a lower level right now anyways, because you're not feeling good, like a lower tempo might be good for your body, whatever. Mm. So I was like, sure, like what else am I going to do? Like, I'm just going to sit at home. So sure, I'll go. And I think that my stubbornness was one of the reasons why, like, I kept going in a lot of ways, because like, at this point, you know, there's been a lot of like, major road bumps or like end of the road kind of moments like yeah in my career um but i was just like man i just i need to figure out just how to keep my career going like if i can just get in some team somewhere and just keep going like maybe like maybe it'll get better like maybe one day there's going to be a sunny day that comes along so yeah there were no sunny days in 2018 (laughs) I was, I was playing division three, not a good standard at all. And, um, about a month in, um, yeah, again, the level was bad. I mean, I wasn't really enjoying it that much. Um, and then a a month in, like I did my groin again, was out for like six weeks. Um, and then come back for like the last bit of the season, which, um, was like, maybe a month to three weeks. And then we were in the, we were in the relegation playoff. (laughs) So we were, we were playing teams from division four from the sixth tier of Swedish football. So it was like uh, (laughs) snow, you know, in in early part of November, late October, they're like clearing off the pitch and Mm. uh, playing games against just like fat guys, like who just want (laughs) to fight you. (laughs) (laughs) Which like, thank goodness, like, we ended up staying up for that club. Mm-hmm. That club's still in Division Three, which great for them. Um, but, yeah, after after that, I was um, – I was really uh, kind of at the end of the road at that point after, after that experience where I was like, I mean, what's my CV right now? Like, yeah, I've played five months in the USL, zero minutes played was on the bench for like, you know, five or six games or whatever. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, Fourth tier Sweden, like played every minute, whatever, like, but that doesn't matter. Uh, PDL, more minutes in the commentary booth than on the pitch. That's not good. And then fifth tier of Sweden where like, I have nothing to show for myself and like, don't even have any video. Like when, why would you even want video from that? So yeah, I remember that off season. I was like, man, this might be it for me. Like, um, but the next year I ended up playing in New Zealand. And, um, the reason I got that is because my friend Zev, again, who I was with at the independence, he was playing here in super Eton in the second tier for, uh, for Varberg, who are now in Alsvenskan in, in the highest level. Wow. And, um, He had a kid who was like 18 or 19 from New Zealand come on trial at his club. And we, Zev and I were both like really into like the tactical side of the game. And uh, this kid was just like unbelievable, like on a really, really good level of like finding space, just like getting on the half turn, like 
yeah, just playing like modern football, like 19 years old, which like you don't really see a lot and you don't expect that from New Zealand. So uh, Zev was like, dude, like what the heck is your story? Like, yeah, how are you here? Like, how are you playing like this when you come from New Zealand? Because people just think like, uh, like Chris Wood, like Winston Reed, like just hard nosed people. Yeah. And um, he was like, oh, yeah, I, I came from this like small academy in Wellington in New Zealand called Ole Football. And, um, yeah, there's like a ton of us that are out like in Europe now and like, they've made a bunch of money off transfers for like people coming from there and like, no one really knows about them. Mm. And so Zev was like, dude, I, whoever started this project, like I have to talk to them. So there ended up being like a couple of American guys involved, um, as like the sporting director and, or technical director and like the first team coach, the guy who started as a, is a, is an English and Kiwi guy named Declan Edge. Um, and, uh, but the other two guys, like I just got in touch with via Zev and, um, they were kind of like, you know, what's your CV, whatever, like they're American. So like, they understood like what Wake Forest was, like they knew what, you know, Charlotte independence was and what all this other stuff was. Mm -hmm. And they were like, look, you can come play in our first team here in the, in the highest level of New Zealand football, but just know that like, it's not going to be about you. Like your role is going to be to be like one of the senior guys in the team to teach a lot of the younger kids, like what it means to be a professional, how to carry themselves, to be a leader, to like learn our methodology as quick as you can. And then like continue to help us in terms of assisting them and like developing them on, on their pathway and on their journey. Um, so I got there and, and actually like that year, was kind of the start for me of like coming out of the bottom, like career wise, like mm. that was where I kind of started to feel like some momentum build with my game. Like I started to feel like I could like have a bit of an identity as a player in terms of like, what's like, what's Jared Odenbeck's football? Like, what does that look like? And that, that time there was really influential with me from like the tactical side of the game and just learning a lot of things. Um, that I needed to kind of like take steps forward in my, in my career, um, more so like on the pitch, less like intangibles, like leadership and that stuff, but more just like on the pitch, like experiencing new systems and new ways of playing. And yeah, a lot of that and play with like a lot of amazing players who are now like playing at super high levels in Europe. Yeah. I, Cause I think you used the perfect word of momentum is so important in a, in a professional career. Like you hear so many pros will say like it, it's not necessarily about always taking a step up each time after a season. It's just about like kind of, especially at the lower levels when you're not, you know, MLS or, or above that, it's just kind of like, can I find another team where I can still play? I can still train and get better. And then, like you said, kind of like biding your time waiting for that, for that sunny day. Um, and it, and then you have that sort of payoff where it sort of starts to creep in in New Zealand where like, all right, the sun's starting to shine a little bit on this career. Um, but I heard you mention before that 2020 was kind of like one of the craziest years for you in terms of your career. So did the New Zealand kind of experience transpire into or transition over into 2020? Or was that when you came back to the States when kind of everything went a little uh, crazy again? No, so... Um... I was in New Zealand and it was getting towards the end of the year. So their, their league system is hilarious. It's, um, it's so Bush league. It's, uh, they have like three regional leagues. Like, so you in New Zealand is two huge islands. Southern Island is bigger than the Northern Island. Um, but you have it split up into three leagues. You have the Northern league, which is like Auckland and like the very top of New Zealand. Cause that's where like, I don't know, probably like 60% of the population lives. Then you have like the southern part of the South Island, which is where Wellington is. That's where I was living. A lot of people living there too. And then you have like all the South Island, which is just like people who surf and snowboard and backpack and <laughs> not that many good footballers. No offense. <laughs> um, and then for another six months out of the year, top 10 teams from those three leagues, like all come together into one league called National League. So I was playing in the central regional league and that season was from like, I don't know, March 
no, February until like August. Um, so I got there in January, played the season. Um, like I said, some really good players, like one of my closest friends there is playing in FC Copenhagen right now. Wow. Um, was like playing in champions league at man city started, started against Sevilla Dortmund, like crazy. Um, and another guy is at Torino right now, like just made his first team debut in the Coppa Italia. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, there was a chance to stay there. Um, but I just, me and, me and uh, one of my best friends from growing up actually played there together in New Zealand. And um, we would joke with like some of the guys, like you can't get caught in the New Zealand cycle of like doing like the regional league, national league, then you're back in the regional league, then you're in the, yeah. na- and like the, the time just doesn't, it doesn't work out well for like any other league in the world to like move somewhere. Cause you're finishing in like, mid to late august yeah in the regional league then the national league starts and the national league's ending in like february march which like isn't good because roster spots are all finalized in the u.s by that point Mm -hmm. so it's just like a total shambles for going anywhere else in the world so we're like dude you cannot get caught in the cycle man like you gotta do anything you can to get out of the cycle so um this league which everyone knows now called nisa started in uh in 2019 in the US. And um, the uh, the coach of Stumptown Athletic got in touch with me. And he was like, I knew him from when I was younger, he used to coach this, uh, this team that's now USL two, that used to be in like the old USL pro back in the day called Charlotte Eagles, which is in my hometown. And he's like in the USL Hall of Fame, great coach, Mark Steffens, he, he just reached out to me and he was like, Hey, I, I know you've been playing in New Zealand, like, you know, what kind of what's your deal? I know things didn't work with independence, but, you know, just seeing if you're available or whatever. Um, and so they ended up offering me a two-year deal, which at that point, like, I wanted a lot of stability in my life. So to go home to, a, like, a familiar place and um, they had, like, really good financial backing. It was, like, $2.5 million investment from this guy. Wow. And uh, Nisa at that time, like, seemed like a decent thing that would grow and, like, be better and um it was that or to go to oakland roots who were also playing in nisa at the time and i was just like yeah if i go to if i go to roots like one my contract's going to be done at the end of the year so it's like a four-month contract that's not cool and then two it's it's going to be in a totally different place that i'm unfamiliar with and i'm just kind of done like going all over the place Mm -hmm. um so i went home but the thing that made 2019 and 2020 so crazy is that six weeks into the year that investor pulled out and was like, yeah, I'm not putting any money in the team. (laughs) And it was, it was totally wild because, um, our GM, great guy, like meant super well, but, um, people weren't getting paid and people started asking questions like, Hey, like, are you, did you get your check? Like, no, I didn't get my check. And like, people were on like pretty big wages. Like, like it was like a too good to be true kind of thing. Um, and so we realized that he had made like a mistake in the negotiations. And, um, at some point there was like a miscommunication in their agreement to where it was never like actually put into writing. And And contracts were, that is? No, like the, uh, the money, the contract for the the investor guy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he was he was like trying to keep the team like afloat, like on his own credit card, like poor guy. I mean, he probably has like six figures, like on his credit card or something like just cause he cared so much about it. And like, he was a, a like tremendous guy, like wanted to do a lot of really good things, but yeah, it just all kind of like blew up in everyone's face. Um, which like, I still have a lot of really close friends from that team. And, um, yeah, that then, shifted into 2020. So it was like, all right, we lost all that money. So then for the next season, this is before COVID, right before COVID, they had to renegotiate everyone's contracts like way down. Like I think the minimum, the minimum pay cut that you could take was like 25% or something like that. Um, so I was like, I want to stay here. Like, I don't have anywhere else to go. Like I played half the season or whatever. So like, what am I going to do? Stay here. Um, so I, re- I renegotiated with them 
and they were saying the whole time, oh, we're going to get, we're going to another investor. Like it's almost over the line. Like, oh, he's, he's signing the paper, like in a couple of days or whatever, like just had a great mm-hmm. call with him, whatever. Like, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that, that never happened. He never, he never signed anything. So we had no financial backing whatsoever for the club outside of like a few sponsors. So I think I got like a third of one of my checks um for that start of 2020 and then that was the time when like uh people were saying on on twitter like oh the nba is canceled or whatever like oh college sports are canceled or then it was like this thing's canceled that thing's canceled and then it's just like wow like we're gonna get canceled next for sure like i remember we flew to la to play la force came back and then we were supposed to play a game i think I think against Cal United, maybe at home the next week. And the commissioner from NISA like showed up at training. And he was like, yeah, we're, we're shutting everything wow. down. Yeah. And then shortly after, um, they announced that like the USL and that stuff would like resume play. I think it was maybe in like July or something. They ended up having like, a, I think the USL had like a 15 or 16 game season. NISA just announced that like, we don't have like, enough teams or owners and like good enough financial positions to carry on for 2020. So 2020 really turned into, uh, <laughs> doing a lot of small sided, like with a bunch of my buddies who are pros, like living in Charlotte and just all in the same situation or like guys that used to play in college. And like, I mean, the COVID world was wild, right? Like no one was really yeah. doing anything. Like people were working, but people were working from home if they had jobs. So like my friends that played like D1 and stuff, I would just call them up be like, hey, like let's go run some pickup in the afternoons. So we were playing like training, playing like five days a week. Um, but I mean, I was doing that and I was I was working at a, a country club, like on the, on the golf side in Charlotte mm-hmm. and uh, like playing a lot of golf training and like and that that was it so yeah 2020 was was not that promising like playing playing indoor at like 10 p.m on a wednesday night with like a bunch of hispanic guys like (laughs) on like concrete 70s astroturf but it was just kind of it was again it's like how can you just like keep this thing going and just be ready yeah because that's what i imagine for you and what a lot of players during that time was that was just about again keeping the flame lit keeping the momentum going and then kind of waiting for whether it be the world to open back up or for you to like just get another opportunity when when did that opportunity kind of finally come knocking um one of my teammates from wake john becaro he uh played at phoenix rising for quite a while and in the mls with toronto and chicago um and he uh, he connected me to the head coach at FC Tucson, who were in the League One in like January, because he had reached out to John saying like, "Hey, do you know any like guys who can play as a six who are like Sergio Busquets light?" Um, <laughs> hey, um, sorry, my wife just got home. Um, but uh, yeah, he was like, "Yeah, I, I know the guy." <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so yeah, we just, we got connected that way. He was like, show me your video. Um, they ended up giving me like a, a one plus one offer. So um, I had a contract for 2021 and then option for 2022. So then that was all done like kind of January of 21. Um, and in a lot of ways, I like looking back on it, I'm like, why the heck would they want to sign me? Like, when I look at my CV, I just think it's hilarious, right? Because my CV is like horrendous. But um, <laughs> I, the coach at the time, like he wanted to play like in a four three three lone six, like wanted to have the ball a lot, and I just like fit the profile good. And it's just one of those things that happens quite a bit in the football world. Is like you know someone who knows someone, like yeah, someone's kind enough to like do you a favor, and then you're the right fit for what they're looking for. Like I'm sure there were plenty of other sixes and eights that were like in the consideration who were better than I was, but that's just how it ended up working out. So how, how did that season uh, pan out? I mean, I know you said it was a a one plus one, but obviously as we look at 2022, like you were back in Sweden, like what was, uh, what was that level like in in Tucson and that experience? 
Yeah, 2021 was was also wild. Um, but again, like, I think this is kind of the theme that keeps coming back up is like, lower level professional football is super unstable, like from, yeah. a, from a life and from a, like career standpoint. Um, so we started off the season in 2021. Um, I was in the starting lineup quite a bit, but we were the worst team in league one. Like mm. we were so bad. And it was crazy because we had one of the best rosters as well. And really? no one could really like put their finger on like why it wasn't working. Um, cause like you would even look at stats and you'd be like, yeah, I mean, statistically, like there's a lot of, a lot of reasons why, like we should have won that game or like we should have done better than we did. Like we really underperformed, but like, I don't know if it was the wrong combination of players at the wrong time, wrong system, like wrong tactic, who knows, like we couldn't figure it out. So they, they sacked that coach, um, unfortunately for him and, um, the guy who was the GM, John Perlman, so one of my good friends to this day, um, he became the head coach and he changed the system like completely. Um, so that was kind of like, that was kind of my ship sailed. And um, he was pretty like, pretty upfront with me of just saying like, hey, like you're like a 10 out of 10 for me in terms of like a culture guy, like locker room guy, like all of that. Like I couldn't ask for any more, but he's like, I'm changing the system quite a bit. We're going to be like a super high pressing, like way more direct kind of team. And I'm really only looking to play with like two guys in the middle. And I want those guys to just be like engine room, like super mobile. Hmm. And you're not that. So he was like, you know, I just want to be up front with you, but like, you're probably not going to play a whole lot. And so I was like, all right, like, again, tons of respect for coaches who do that. Cause a lot of coaches would just, not say anything and just, you know, let it, let it roll. Yeah. Um, so at that point, uh, I was like, well, I want to play. Like <laughs> I just spent all of 2021, like, you know, yeah. playing in the park with my friends or, or 2020, like playing in the park with my friends basically. So, um, I want to play football matches and I want to keep testing myself. And most importantly, like, I want to keep learning, like, I, especially I want to keep learning, like, the kind of football that I was really interested in, kind of from my, like, New Zealand experience. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my teammates from the original Stumptown NISA team became the assistant coach um, of, like, the third iteration of Stumptown Athletic. <laughs> and uh, he told me that they were kind of, like, looking for someone to bring in. Um, like on loan in the middle part of the year. So for me, I talked to the coach on the phone, who's now the coach of Chattanooga in um, in Nisa. And he plays like a really, it's, a, it's super structured, but it's a really exciting way to play for someone who wants to have the ball and for someone who wants to like control the game. And so he kind of like pitched his vision to me of like how he wanted to play. And I was like, at the very least, like I'm going to learn a lot from this guy. Mm -hmm. in terms of like the tactical side and, and for the future so plus it's in my hometown like easy decision there and um and they were able to pick up a hundred percent of my loan from tucson or from a hundred percent of my wage from tucson so like for tucson it was a no-brainer too like they can totally clear the wage bill of me and like forget about me forever <laughs> um so for me i was like yeah 100 percent, i'll do that um so yeah, I, I left there, um, not an easy decision by any means, but again, I felt like it was kind of the right thing to like keep moving in the right direction as much as possible. Yeah. Um, it was kind of during that time as well that I also knew that I wanted to move or at least try to move to Sweden in, um, in 2022 to okay. be closer to my then girlfriend and to try to make her my wife. <laughs> um so i was like i'm gonna need video i need to play games if i'm like riding pine at tucson like that's not gonna help me out yeah. um and yeah i think kind of at 20 2021 was kind of like when my focus started to shift from like yes i love playing football yes i want to do it as long as i can yes like it's been my dream since i was a kid but there started to be kind of like other factors that were playing a bigger role in terms of like shifting the direction that my career would move in. Hmm. 
So when did uh did you meet your girlfriend now wife in that second stint when you went to Sweden? No, I didn't. So yeah, this is always like the wildest story for everyone. But we actually met on Twitter. That's where all wow. the all the attractive Swedish women are. People are out there <laughs> wondering if they're if they're single and, and looking. Um yeah, just totally wild story. I mean, we watched um we watched this documentary um called American Gospel around the same time. It's kind of uh it's it's kind of like an investigation into like a lot of these like mega churches in the US that like yeah talk about Christian faith in a way that like ends up exploiting people in a lot of ways, like either for their service or for their money or like for a lot of stuff like that. So it's like a super, like super niche documentary, something I was interested in. And, um, I was in the comment section, like kind of scrolling through and, um, through their tweets. And I saw someone like writing in Swedish and like Sweden's like one of the top five, probably most secular countries in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, it's kind of weird. Like, kind of sweet is watching this documentary like that's yeah. so niche <laughs> and uh yeah so i just like sent her messages i was like you know are you are you a swede like just i wrote to her in swedish like are you a swede like are you watching this documentary like because you're in the u.s like what's your deal and so we just kind of started talking and like she's like yeah i'm, I'm from the gothenburg area like i was like well i lived there for like you know eight months in total and like i know a lot of people there or whatever so we we ended up realizing like we knew a lot of people kind of like in the same like same uh, environments that are like crossing paths and stuff. And like we were in a lot of the same places at the same time, just like never met. And this was also like during COVID, like this was like uh, 2020 January, like when, when I first like spoke to her. So like all of COVID, like we were just like long distance online, just like FaceTime, like getting to know each other, like in a really friendly way at the start. And then like, eventually we were just kind of like, Hey, like, like in, in theory, like in practice, like are those are to totally, uh, two totally different things, but like in theory, like this, this would be great. Like we just need to meet in person and like, see how it is like in practice, like who knows that's a totally different thing. Um, so it took us like, yeah, almost like, I guess like a year and three quarters, like to be able to meet because of all the travel restrictions and stuff. And she's a nurse. So like, it was always impossible for her to to leave work or get time off like in that time. Cause she was totally taken out of like her orthopedic nursing and just thrown into like, here's a bunch of COVID patients, like good luck. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we eventually got to meet like at the very end of my, uh, NISA season in 2021, like when I was on loan. Um, and then I was like, well, I, I need to, I need to come here. Like I need to meet her family, like not just over FaceTime, but like in person and like, see how she is like in her environment here and like see if I can get a contract here, which is like not at all like straightforward or, or easy thing to do because of all the work permit stuff and how yeah. small clubs have for budgets at the, at the third tier in, in division one here. But um, yeah, it ended up working out. Is it, in, do you ever look back and it, it's kind of interesting to like see the the story just sort of, come to a, a full circle right like obviously sweden is a is a special place to you for a lot of different reasons but like that first kind of moment when you got to sweden where it was like it was met with a lot of adversity and you were like i don't know if this feels right and even before going there it was kind of like some trepidation about whether or not to go and then you know obviously the second stint where it's like what level am i playing at what like what is happening here um and now even too the the team that you wound up signing with was the team that like you went on trial with. Uh, I think that's right. Right. Where yeah. you, uh, where you had your injury. Um, and now it's like, you have so many things in your life kind of that have made the, the puzzle make sense and, and put all the pieces together to have the contract and, you know, family now as well. And, and, and something like that. Do you ever kind of look back at that and just, it's a, uh, as you mentioned, it's a, a crazy arc of a footballer, but it's funny how sometimes it, uh, it, it works out just like that. Totally. Totally. I mean, um, I had a lot of, a lot of strikeouts at the start of this year, like going on trial places where it was like, Hey, we don't have enough money to pay your work permit. Hey, we don't think you're that good to merit getting that much money. Um, 
So I was kind of like, I was kind of on my last leg, dude. And I, I just was like, what if I went back to Yung Chile? Like no one is like the same there. Like everyone's new, like none of the same people are there anymore. But like, what if I just like showed up? Like, mm. again, going back to like what my dad told me, like when I was like 18, what's the worst that could happen? Exactly. So I got on the train and took like a two hour journey from uh, my wife's hometown to Yung Chile. And I showed up there and all other teams were training. So I was like, all right, for sure, they're going to be training today. I'll just show up. Someone will be there. There was one car there and like one light on in the whole like club building. And I was like, all right, there's no training today. Like, sweet. I just wasted a whole day, a bunch of money. Like, and I, yeah, I just wasted four hours of my life basically. But um, I could see the guy who was like in the window up there. And um, I was like, all right, I just need to look on the website and figure out who that guy is. And then I'm going to call him. <laughs> uh, so I, I got in touch with him through WhatsApp and he was like, hey, like I like he was listed as kind of like sporting group kind of guy. But he's like, I do absolutely zero with like the football side of things. I'm strictly like financial, like visa, like all that kind of stuff. But like, mm -hmm. here's our head coach's number. like." You can try him, but I can't promise anything like good luck, basically. Yeah. So I still left feeling like super deflated, but I was like, well, I'll just call the guy. So I, I called the coach the next day and and he answered. And like, obviously, like he has no clue who the heck I am. Like, it's just some American number calling him. So he's like, I don't know, maybe he thinks it's like uh, MLS, like <laughs> wanting to get him as a coach or something. Uh, so he answered and I just, I kind of remember thinking in my head, like, all right, the first like 15 seconds of this call are going to determine like whether or not he hangs up immediately or whether like I have like any kind of skin in the game here. So mm -hmm. I just kind of introduced myself and like explained my situation. And he was kind enough to say like, yeah, send over your video. Like I'll take a look at it. We need someone to play in the middle this next year. So like, could be you, who knows? Um, I ended up going on trial. I was there for like three weeks almost a month and um yeah it's the most those those months were the most nervous i've ever been as a player because it was like it's not only just like are you going to get a contract it's like are you going to be able to stay in this country and like be with someone that you really care about yeah so i had i had like a lot of extra motivation for sure um at that time but ended up getting a contract um they were able to sort out my work permit and um, yeah, lots of ups and downs this year. But again, like I was able to extend for next year as well. So I'm through 2023 now. And um, I think again, I just, I look back with a lot of thankfulness because I know where I've come from and I also know like where I've been, like, yeah, I've been in some pretty bad spots where like, yeah, for all intents and purposes, like I probably should have retired. Um, but I just, I always felt like, I just, I feel like the story's not done yet. Like, I feel like there's going to be a sunny day that comes at some point. Um, and, uh, if you know who Jay Demerit is, he used to play for the national team and like was captain mm -hmm. of Watford. He has a really cool story. And like, I think a lot of people are like, oh, I'm, I'm the next Jay Demerit. I'm the next Jamie Vardy. And like, I'm not going to tell someone that they're not. But like those guys like didn't even, they didn't even want to be the next Jada Merritt or Jamie Vardy, you know, they were just playing and they were just doing their thing and like they got their chance and they took their chance and like, good for them. Yeah. Um, but he did a Ted talk once and um, I connect with him a lot. Cause I was, I was born in Wisconsin. He was born in Wisconsin. He loves the green Bay Packers. So do I. Um, and uh, I just always liked, he was super blue collar, but he said, he said that thing of like, you never know when your sunny day is going to come. Mm. So like, whenever it's dark, whenever you're struggling, whenever things just don't make sense, like just keep thinking about it's going to be worth it when my sunny day comes and I just need to be ready for my sunny day. And, uh, for me, that was always kind of like my, my driving factor. Like I, I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know when it would end, 
but I just always kind of had the mentality of like, I want to see this out until the end. And like one day I'm going to decide like, that's enough. Like, I don't need to play anymore. I don't want to play anymore, but I want to, I want to get to that point and um, I'll find it like one way or another. So yeah, here's to, yeah. Uh, to I guess, to continuing that, yeah. that journey. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's, that's an awesome way to, to kind of cap it up. I, I mean, you, you even look at like that kind of last phase that we've just talked about of your story, like everything that you had done sort of in, in still pushing for that sunny day built up to like this kind of this microcosm of an event, right. That led to now, you know, what is quote unquote your sunny day right now. And I'm sure there's still many more to come, but you know, I think many people would look at a situation like you described of how you even got this final team of, so it's like, wait, I have to take a two hour train to somewhere where I don't know if anyone's going to be there and then look through the window and w call somebody that I've never met before. Right. <laughs> like, like to a footballer, that sounds like, oh, like that's, you know, that's kind of a way that people have gotten trials. We all know guys who have done things even crazier than that to get trials. Right. But to the normal person who just wants to go and, and get a job in an office, you know, things don't really happen that way but you had built up this kind of resilience and this adversity over the course of your career. And now it's like, boom, it kind of paid off with one of those sunny days. So it's a, uh, it's cool. It's cool to see. And I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story. It's been amazing for me to hear. And, and I'm sure the people are, are really going to love it as well. It's uh, it's been, a, it's been an awesome one. Thanks so much, Brendan. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you having me on and just, um, yeah, it's been cool to get to know you and uh, and just connect with you. And I think, like we said earlier, like football is like an amazing uniting effect, like effect on people. And yeah, um, I look forward to staying in touch with you. Awesome. Me as well. That's going to do it for myself and Jared. Thank you so much to him for taking time on, on two days to be able to share his story with all of you. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you to all of you out there who are listening. I greatly appreciate your support and and thank you so much. It means the world to me. Continue to be on the lookout for new episodes. We've got a lot of exciting things coming. Some big names on the docket as well. So look out for that. Uh, if you love the show, if you want to support it just that little bit extra, I would greatly appreciate you checking out the Patreon page link down below and becoming a patron of the In the Eleven podcast. That would mean the world to me. I will catch you guys all on the next one and see you next week. Peace.